gathered uh, online today. Uh, so glad uh, each of you is with us. Uh, a special welcome to those of you who are newer or, or visiting today, uh, maybe even uh, for the first time. I, I hope that you uh, feel uh, welcomed, uh, that, that this is a hospitable place, and that you are uh, already encountering a God's Spirit with you today. Uh, I really hope that you'll find, uh, and I believe that you'll find that this uh, congregation is one that you can easily get connected to and grow in as you journey with Jesus. Uh, uh, forgive me for just a minute while I, I share uh, a little bit of church family business. Uh, if you're newer or, or you don't know what I'm talking about, you just, just pause for a minute, uh, come back uh, in a minute. Uh, but, but I just want to uh, address those of us who are a part of this church family. Uh, you're, you're probably aware already that uh, our church is, uh, has begun the inquiry process to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church in order to affiliate with the global Methodist Church. Um, n neither of those decisions is final until our membership votes uh, on uh, each of those matters. And, you know, the number one question that I'm getting uh, from you all in that regard, I, I get it uh, almost daily, is, hey, when are we going to vote? When is that vote? Uh, I want to make sure I have that on my calendar. When are, when are we going to get to that? Can we just get it over? When are we going to vote? Uh, that's a, some form or another. Those are the questions uh, that, I, that I get uh, almost daily. And I, I just want to share that, unfortunately, uh, we cannot have that vote, uh, hold that vote, until our, uh, our representation of our church, our disaffiliation team, meets with uh, and negotiates with our conference disaffiliation team in order to negotiate what our cost will be uh, to uh, leave. And our, our team um, is still waiting for the conference to schedule that first meeting where those negotiations will begin. Um, in, in the meantime, everything that our leadership knows is uh, available for you uh, to uh, to read and uh, and wrestle with. Uh, it's available on our website in the form of some frequently asked questions. If you aren't like a web savvy person and you want that in paper, uh, just contact our church office. We'll print that out for you uh, so that uh, can help you. And, and if you have any questions, though, that's the place to turn. That's everything that we know. And uh, once uh, once we know more, uh, you will know more. So as hard as it is, uh, we encourage you to, uh, to be patient as we wait for, uh, for those negotiations to take place. Uh, yeah, gosh, it, it just seems like there's a lot going on uh, sometimes uh, when you step back and you, you think about it, doesn't it? I mean, all that disaffiliation stuff aside, uh, I think there are uh, just tons of uh, exciting things happening in our church family these days. Um, yeah, our move to two worship services uh, beginning in just a couple of weeks on September 18th. Uh, journey groups have kicked off again uh, for the fall. If you got our newsletter uh, or if you haven't, you can grab one on the way out, but there are lots of opportunities to get connected in a journey group. Our student ministry is again in full swing after the summer break. Uh, the, the, if you're a traditional a uh, music style person, the, the bell choir, the chancel choir, uh, have been uh, getting geared up. They've had some parties the last couple weekends. There were cars here all day yesterday for that. Uh, uh, and also uh, gearing up for a children's choir uh, beginning again this fall. Uh, there's Bible boot camp coming for elementary age school kids on Wednesday nights this fall. Uh, our Joy Seekers group, uh, that would be uh, those who are... Uh, older uh, on average, uh, I'd say retirement-ish, um, uh, that our Joy Seekers group is, uh, has a, a fun outing planned on, uh, in this coming month in September. Uh, they meet every month. Uh, our Upward team has already begun preparing to welcome hundreds of cheerleaders and basketball players and their families for this new season. In fact, if you are, have any desire to volunteer as a coach or a referee, 
uh, holler uh, to me. Uh, uh, we also just hired a new administrative assistant this past week, and, and I'm pumped about uh, our, our upcoming message series that we're launching next month, a series called uh, God Can. Uh, it's a 10-week study of the book of Nehemiah. There are, there are so many great things planned for the next few months. Uh, really is a perfect time to get connected. So if you've been uh, maybe uh, disconnected for a little while or or just uh, been traveling uh, for a bit, uh, I think it's a perfect time uh, for you to jump back in and get connected. I know in our house, it's just this new school year. We've got kids in two uh, brand new to them schools, and, and we've been running around from one place to the next place and just trying to get settled into our new fall, end of summer routine. And that might may be the case for you too. Uh, I hope uh, and would encourage you to make some of these exciting things going on in our church part of your new routine. Uh, and speaking of new, uh, we have just a couple of weeks left in our All Things New uh, tour of the Bible's essential passages. Uh, the, the idea is that through Christ, God is making all things new. We've already seen uh, that God has made us into new creations and that we uh, have been entrusted with this new ministry, a ministry of reconciliation, as we ourselves have been reconciled to God. We've seen how God is, has uh, created for us a brand new community, uh, the church. And in today's tour stop, we're going to see that God is calling us to an all-new way of thinking. Uh, you already heard our scripture passage for today, Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 1 and 2, a very, very famous passage. Um, uh, some of you may very well have it committed to memory, and it's, it's short enough that I figure I can read it again for you. Let's let this uh, soak in. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You know, I, I felt that it was pretty important that at least one tour stop uh, uh, during this 20-week series be from the book of Romans. Uh, I mean, the book of Romans is... Uh, and some argue the most important book of the New Testament because it clearly and thoroughly articulates the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. I mean, we are touring the Bible's essential passages, right? Uh, so to not stop somewhere in the book of Romans would uh, be akin to, I don't know, visiting St. Louis for the very first time and not even stopping to look at the arch, Right? To say that, I mean, it would be an understatement to say that uh, that, that would be an oversight. And, and of all the passages in the book of Romans, this one may be the most comprehensive because of the way that it begins. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, that, that transitional word, uh, therefore, uh, connects all that uh, has been said in the first 11 chapters of Romans with what Paul, the, the writer of this letter, is about to say. Uh, that's why I say it's pretty comprehensive, because it alludes to everything, everything that has come before. And, and what's come before? Well, an entire 11 chapters outlining God's mercy. In chapters 1 through 3, Paul uh, uh, built the argument that all people, all of us, have rebelled against God. Uh, his particular audiences were uh, Jews and Gentiles, uh, people who were uh, the people of God, uh, Israel beforehand, and everybody else. And he was saying, yeah, of course, the Gentiles, uh, they, they had rebelled against God. But you Jews, you have too. Everybody, everybody is in the same boat. He wrote, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. 
And then in chapters 4 through 7, he not only articulates that, that our sin and our rebellion deserves death. Uh, you may recall the famous passage, for the wages of sin is death. But Paul also makes the case that it's only by faith that we can receive uh, God's great mercy. We, we can't earn it through obedience to his law. I mean, God's grace is freely offered, and we only can receive it by faith. Specifically, by faith in Jesus and his atoning sacrifice on our behalf. That's what chapter 8 really just brings home. Uh, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For what the law was powerless to do, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful humanity to be a sin offering. That is the, the mercy of God that Paul is referring to here in verse 1 of chapter 12. He's saying, hey everyone, if you believe that, if you believe everything that I've, that, that I've just shared, if you believe the good news that despite your sin and rebellion that deserves death, God sent Jesus as a sacrifice in your place so that you could receive that gift by faith. And then you, you're no longer condemned because you are in Christ Jesus. If you believe that good news of God's mercy, then I urge you to live this way. And how shall we live? I'm glad you asked. Second half of verse 1. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. What what, what does it mean to offer your bodies? the, the, The Greek word for body here is the word soma. And uh, when you kind of study uh, what its, its uh, usage is, not just in the Bible, but in other uh, Greek writings, you, you quickly find that soma is, a, is an all-encompassing word. It, it's not, not just your physical body, but it means everything about you. It essentially means your whole person. Paul is saying, offer all of yourself. Everything you've got, your whole person, uh, John Wesley, uh, who's the, the founder of the Methodist movement, um, he uh, wrote a, a commentary, just a, some notes on the whole New Testament. And, and it's a, a, a habit of mine when I'm preaching a, a sermon to, to just kind of see, oh, what did John Wesley think? Sometimes he says very little. Uh, other times he has a lot to say about it. In this particular case, he, he noted that this mention of offering our bodies uh, to God in chapter 12 is meant to stand as a sharp contrast to uh, chapter 1, when those who rebelled against God, remember Paul was making a case that all have rebelled against God, uh, in chapter 1, uh, it's it meant to, it, this chapter 12 is meant to stand against uh, those who rebelled against God by defiling their body um, in all sorts of sexually immoral ways. But now, in view of God's great mercy, we're called to offer our bodies for something else. In this case, Paul says, a living sacrifice. What does it mean to be a living sacrifice? Um, it's, it's really kind of morbid even and, and paradoxical uh, in the scriptures. Is, uh, the word for sacrifice literally means like killing. What, what, what does it mean to be a living killing? Uh, uh, well, well, this sacrifice language is definitely, I mean, it's definitely an allusion to the previous language of Romans that identified Jesus as our sacrifice. Our sacrifice taking the place of, of whatever Old Testament sacrifices that were made on behalf of people's sins. Same language, same language. Uh, but unlike those Old Testament sacrifices, Uh, Offering our bodies as a living sacrifice is not about atoning for our own sin. In in other words, we don't need to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to God um, in order to be saved. Uh, That would defeat the whole purpose of what Paul is saying here. He's saying Jesus has already done that for you. You you don't have to do it again. I mean, that, that was God's mercy that Jesus 
could be a perfect sacrifice for our sins. So, so us offering our bodies, our whole selves to God as a living sacrifice is our response to God's great mercy. It, it's not saving us. It's just our response to God's great love for us. Because God has saved us through Christ, we should offer ourselves back to him. You know, and offering ourselves as a living sacrifice is also unlike Old Testament sacrifices in that those Old Testament sacrifices, uh, they were made and then they were done for a year. Right? You, you, you come to the altar. And in the Old Testament, if you were you're here a couple years ago when we were studying the book of Hebrews, you, you, you remember this. You, you come, uh, come to the altar with, with your offering that the priest would, would kill your offering uh, on the altar for your sins, and then you'd go home. <laughs> you're done. You're done for a year. The offering was made. It was killed. You're finished uh, for, a, for a year until you bring another offering next year for your sins. There's nothing more to do. But offering your whole self as a living sacrifice is not just like uh, an annual appointment. Uh, it, it's never over. It's constant. It's every day. It's every moment. You don't get a day off from being a living sacrifice because the offering isn't killed. Right? You're a living sacrifice. So you are perpetually, as long as you draw breath, perpetually offering your life to God. There are no breaks. Being a living sacrifice means that you are really, I mean, rather intensely following Jesus all the time with every breath that you take. But, but you know, like those Old Testament sacrifices, something does die. You don't die. You, you keep on living. But something about you must die. Here's what dies on the altar when you offer your entire self as a living sacrifice. Here's what dies. Here's what's killed. Your right to choose how you live your life. When you offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, you are surrendering your right to live your life as you see fit. Gosh, I was taking notes over here. If anybody was watching me like while we were singing, you're probably thinking, what is that? He's not even singing to God. He's over there writing down notes. It's because as we were singing, I was like, these songs, we sang it over and over again. We sang this. I lay me down. I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. I, I can't carry a tune, but I remember the words. Right? With, with my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. All I am, I surrender. Gosh, there were three songs we just sang. We just sang that. We just sang our scripture passage for today. You, you essentially, what you're doing is you, you're saying, God, I offer myself as a living sacrifice. This sacrifice, I'm taking my hands off the reins of my life, Lord. I, I am no longer my own. I will follow your ways. God, I will follow your scripture's teachings even when I don't like it. Even when I think, well, gosh, if it was up to me, I would choose something different. It's a complete surrender to everything that is holy and pleasing to God. And, and, and you know, this, this just kind of requires some self-reflection on each of our parts. As you think to yourself, am I a, a living sacrifice? Living as, am I, have I given my whole self to God? And have I sacrificed, have I sacrificed my control, my right to choose the way that I live my own life? Am I a living sacrifice? And as you self-reflect, please know that if you pick and choose 
what you'll follow and what you won't, then, then your hands are still on the reins. You're still in charge. You're still taking control. You, you haven't yet sacrificed your ways. If you are picking and choosing which of God's ways you'll follow and which ones you just prefer not to, then you're not a living sacrifice. Yes, you're living. Praise God, you're living. But you're not a sacrifice. Your right to choose how you live your life has not yet been killed on the altar. But when you do, when you respond to God's great mercy by offering your whole self as a living sacrifice, then, then, then Paul says that is holy and that is pleasing to God. And it's true worship. In, in other words, that's what it means to fully love and honor God. I, I always kind of think of this. This reminds me of our tour stop a few weeks ago when we looked at the book of First John where we learned that hey, really loving God means obeying God's commands. That's what it means to love and to worship God. But let's look, let's look at verse 2 here, because this, this is equally uh, powerful and relevant for us. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Uh, I, I want to work backward on, on this verse here. The, the goal here, what we're moving toward, is that we would know God's will. God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. In, in some form or another, this is like the number one question that I receive as a pastor. I mean, other than, hey, when are we going to have that boat? Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, th that's, a, this is a question that I get, right? Uh, hey, how do I know what God wants? How do I know that this is God's will? How do I know what direction God would have me go in? This is, this is like the number one question I get as a pastor. It's kind of like a spiritual direction question. Like, what does God want? Is this what God wants? Is this what God, what, what does God want? Uh, number one question. How can I know what God's will is in this situation or that situation? Now, if, if you're not wanting to offer your body, your whole self, as a living sacrifice to God, then you probably don't care too much about what God's will is for your life. Because you're just going to do what you want to do anyway. right? However, if you're one of those who is so grateful for God's mercy... That Jesus saved you from your sin such that, that you want to gladly offer your entire life back to God and for God's purposes, no longer living for yourself but for God. Then the question, what is God's will? What is God's perfect, pleasing, and good will? That question, re that really matters. It matters because you want to follow God's ways. So that's the goal here, to know what God wants, to know his will. But how do we arrive at that destination? How can we know God's will? This is how. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is where we get into the new thinking. Uh, but to understand what what's really being said here, uh, I think we need to better understand what is meant uh, by the word world here. Uh, uh, Paul, uh, what is he talking about here? I mean, is Paul talking about not conforming to our present culture and the society around us? Uh, I'm not so sure that that's really wh what he's getting at although there may be some overlap in application, if that's how you've always seen it and tried to, to follow it. There may be some overlap. Um, but, but the Greek word here that's translated for world is the word ion. Uh, and I don't expect you to remember that, uh, but, but it's best translated as the word age. Like a time period, an age, um, not culture but age. 
Uh, do not conform to the pattern of this age. You see, Paul and other New Testament writers understood that through Jesus' life and death and resurrection and ascension, that he ushered in a brand new age, the age of God's kingdom reign, the age of the power of God's spirit at work in the world. This is the age where God is making all things new. And I believe Paul is saying here, hey, don't conform to the pattern of the present age, but be transformed with the new thinking of the age to come. The, the age that Jesus has inaugurated and ushered in. And, and there will be a time when uh, the, this new age is complete. And God reigns over everything and everyone. And we're actually going to look at that in, in a couple of weeks. When, when God finishes the work of making all things new. Uh, but right now, right now in this present moment, we are in between... The ages. Uh, the, the, the present age is still present. And, and it's, it's defined. You can describe it. It's an age uh, uh, that is ruled by sin and death and pain and injustice. But, but Jesus ushered in a brand new age. The age that is to come. The age of God's spirit. It's defined by, by life and healing and justice and abundance and, and these two ages are existing in our world now in our lives overlapping simultaneously they're both at work god god's mercy is abundant and and healing happens and lives are transformed but there's still death and sin and pain it's, it's where the age-old question, why do good things still happen if God loves us and all these wonderful things have happened in Christ? It's because these ages are, are overlapping right now. The age to come is not yet totally complete. There's still, there's still, the present age is still here, but God's kingdom is here too, and they're, they're overlapping. They're both at work today. I, I liken it to jet lag. Anybody here have jet lag before? You traveled? Yeah. Not the best. Like, I can handle it mostly. The older I get, uh, uh, the, the more I'm affected by it. Uh, but, but I, oh goodness, I remember when we brought our daughter Anna home from China. She was just a couple weeks shy of being one year old. And, oh, it took her almost three weeks to get over the jet lag. And it was miserable. This girl, this, it, it was like this girl belonged to one time zone, right? But she was living in another time zone. And, and, and they were completely opposite time zones, right? She was awake all night and sleeping all day. Uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was horrible. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just glad that's not the case anymore. Uh, but, but Paul is saying, hey, do not be conformed to the present age and its way of thinking. You do not belong to that time zone anymore. You do not belong to the age of sin and death and pain and injustice. That is not the age you belong to. Your, your thinking needs to be transformed. You need to get familiar with your new time zone you belong in the age to come. The age where Jesus is Lord. The, the age of life and love and healing and justice. That's the age you belong to. So have your mind transformed so you start thinking in a new way. I mean, ultimately, Paul realizes that when our thinking is right, then our actions will follow. Uh, I, I believe that. That's, what, that's why I think, hey, uh, good theology, a good understanding of who God is and, and w you know, how he created us and what he wants for our lives, understanding that well, that leads to right action and right behavior. 
Not that we don't screw it up along the way, but, but that's the best pathway forward, to have right thinking, then, then all the other stuff follows. Uh, we need new thinking. We need to be transformed as we embrace the reality that we are residents of the age to come. We're not residents of the present age anymore. Almost as if we're living in a time zone that we don't belong to. And you know what's a really amazing about this? Is that, that as the ages overlap and we belong to the age to come, we've, we've been invited into God's kingdom reign in in. in in the midst of the present age. You know, God is at work in, in and through you and me and the church, which we're like agents of the, the age to come. Uh, God is at work through us to transform the world and the, the present age to resemble the age to come. It's like God is using us to close the gap the, the age that, that we already belong to. We're to have God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's, that's like our role and part of our purpose. God is working through us to make all things new. So, do not conform to this present age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, this passage doesn't uh, uh, cover exactly what that new way of thinking entails, what, what it's, what, w- exactly what is a part of all of that new thinking. This, this is really just a summary verse. It's a transition from, in view of God's mercy, live this way, and then Paul's going to share a lot of what that new thinking is in the chapters to follow. So I encourage you to read that. Really, Paul talks about that new way of thinking throughout the entire New Testament and all of his letters, and, and others do too. Uh, but but I, I'd like to conclude our, our time together simply praying that our minds would be transformed to become like the mind of Jesus. I mean, that's the perfect description of, of how our thinking should be transformed. To be like Jesus. Oh, Christ, be magnified in me. That's the perfect description. And I I found this prayer in our book of worship that I I would love for us to pray together. Um, The the response is printed in your message notes. Uh, It will also come up on the screen. This is the response that I'd like you to pray um, when it's the proper time. May this mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. And I'm going to pray four different segments of uh, kind of, hey, this was the mind of Jesus. And then at the end of each of those segments, I'm going to invite us all to respond with this request of God. So l- l- let's practice that response right now. Uh, it's, it's on the screen uh, together. May this mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. That's pretty good. I think you're ready. Uh, So let's join together in prayer, and I'll prompt you when it's time to pray that response. Let us pray. Let us remember Jesus, who though he was rich, yet for our sakes became poor and dwelt among us. Who was content to be subject to his parents, the child of a poor couple's home who lived for 30 years the common life, earning his living with his own hands and declining no humble task, whom the people heard gladly, for he understood their ways. Let us pray. May this mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. Let us remember Jesus, who is mighty indeed, healing the sick, and the disordered, using for others the powers he would not invoke for himself, who refused to force people's allegiance, who was master and lord to his disciples, yet was among them as their companion and as one who served, 
whose desire was to do the will of God who sent him. Let us pray. May this mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. Let us remember Jesus, who loved people, yet retired from them to pray. Rose a great while before day, watched through the night, stayed in the wilderness, went up into a mountain, sought a garden. Who, when he would help a tempted disciple, prayed for him. Who prayed for the forgiveness of those who rejected him and for the perfecting of those who received him. Who observed the traditions, but defied convention that did not serve the purposes of God, who hated the sins of pride and selfishness, of cruelty and impurity. Let us pray. May this mind be in us, which was in Christ Jesus. Let us remember Jesus, who believed in people and never despaired of them, who through all disappointment never lost heart, who disregarded his own comfort and convenience and thought first of others' needs, and though he suffered long, was always kind, who when he was reviled uttered no harsh word in return, and when he suffered did not threaten retaliation, who humbled himself and carried obedience to the point of death, even death on the cross. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him. Let us pray. May this mind be in us, which is, was in Christ Jesus. And all of God's people agreed, said, Amen.